Hey guys, welcome back for more Corpse Factory. So let's continue Aoi's act. Act number three. She's going to meet with Noriko now. We're in the front of the factory, by the way. Let's see the confrontation. The factory is a rundown mess. How can anyone live here is beyond me. I suppose I'll just find a way to make it feel like home. <laughs> she planned everything. Maybe once I'm inside a Noriko's skin, I'll be able to understand why she is comfortable here. Yeah, the more I look at it, the better it seems. This will be my home. I'll be Noriko and live here happily ever after. I will, I'll sit back and enjoy the life that she has been withholding from me. Firstly, I need to find somewhere to change my clothes. I can kill someone if I'm wearing my nice dress. That's just not acceptable. I did consider changing at home, but then I would have scored funny looks from people in the train right over here. Is it strange that a dead girl fears, fears her entering a socially awkward situation? I always go out of my way to avoid uncomfortable situations. Perhaps that's just a remnant of the life I once knew. Something I cannot quite leave behind. It's the same as my obsessive compulsions. They cling to me like carrion flies swarming over my corpse. I shouldn't be worried about any of those things, but dead or not, my mind can just discard the anxieties that shaped my entire life. Wait, what am I doing? Why am I trapping myself in pointless thoughts? My goal is right in front of me. Noriko is in the other side of that brick wall, completely unaware of what is about to happen. A heavy handed slap to my face doesn't sting, but it causes me to reevaluate what I'm doing. Focus. First, I'll change into the great gear provided to me by the HRS. Then I'll shimmy into the factory through an open window. I'll locate Noriko and drive a knife into her chest. I'll block her still beating heart. Oh my god. From her body like a ripe strawberry. And then I'll carve my name into the pulsating blood spurting organ. Noriko's life will be over and I'll be reborn. I'll baptize myself in her lifeblood and become the girl I've always wanted to be. She's so crazy, man. And I'll be happy. Happy just like Noriko. That smiling, carefree girl that I spent my youth with. The girl that faced her mother's attempted suicide with a stoic smile. The girl that didn't flinch when her father walked out. The girl that stayed inside day after day when the outside world just become too scared to face. The happy, carefree girl without a single real problem. She never knew how good her life was. She wouldn't have lasted a day in my shoes. I hate her so much. I'm going to become her. My backpack hits the ground with a dull impact. I tear my yellow sundress from my shoulders and let it fall to the ground just like a snake sheds its skin. The cool afternoon breeze bites at my naked skin and make the tiny hairs across my body stand on end. Why can the dead feel so cold? The dead shouldn't feel anything. I crouch and rummage through my backpack, withdrawing my change of clothes. Slowly, calmly, deliberately, I dress myself in the dark gear that marks me as a herald, one of many. I note that comforting weight of four knives concealed within my jacket, one in each sleeve and two against my chest. It's important to be armed to the teeth. After donning every article, I pull the broad mask out of the bag. A mask in the likeness of Corpse Girl, my enemy and my future identity. I slide the mask over my face and a curtain of calm descends over me. This is the last time I march forward in the name of the HRS. This is for my own personal agenda. The scheming of that rebellious group of killers no longer guides my hand. The time has come. I approach the factory's front entrance and try to... What? Try the door simply out of curiosity. I don't expect Noriko to have lowered her guard so much, and yet, the door swings open. She left it unlocked, a mistake I would never have made thanks to my overbearing compulsions. This place reeks of death. If I wasn't so accustomed to the smell, I'd probably vomit. Do dead girls vomit? The dull, steady hum of an air conditioner registers in my consciousness, but... That doesn't distract me from examining the surroundings. Countless empty body bags are strewn across the pockmarked concrete floor. Some are stained with brown blood and some are completely clean. A series of shelves, almost like a warehouse, racks 
run along the walls and across the floor in haphazard patterns. Whoever planned this layout was out of their mind. Whoever, however, this is my home now. My home. Soon. Striding forward, I weave between shelves and step over discarded body bags. So far, there has been no indication of Noriko's presence. Still, I draw a knife from inside my sleeve so that it rests in the palm of my hand. The metal handle is cold. Cold? Why do you feel so cold? The entire factory is like a freezer. How can Noriko live here? Hey. Oh, there we go. My torso twists in reaction to the mon monotone syllable. The quick movement sends a shooting pain across my chest. Pain? Pain. It's you. Hello, Harold. It took me a while, but I figured out what your mask is supposed to be. It's like an artistic representation of Corpse Girl, right? The Corpse Girl mascot that appears on my website. Noriko flashes her phone at me and I glare at the website display. Hmm. I mean, yeah, it has those, uh, what do you call this? That's totally copyright infringement. Copyright infringement. I don't know what to say to her. This isn't exactly how I imagined this encounter would play Why out. Why did you fake Junpei Matsumoto's death? You know what I'm talking about, right? That time we met in the underground parking lot. You planted a look-alike corpse to fool us into thinking Junpei had died. Total corpse girl move, by the way. Guess you stole that strategy from me too. I s oh, sorry, I'm sorry. She steps forward with a hand outstretched. I instinctively lashed out with my knife and slash her wrist, but her hands come to the rest on my shoulder and the tiny nick from my inaccurate blade not even prompting a spurt of blood. Ouch! That stung a little. The warmth of her hand seeps into my shoulder. It's almost comforting. Howie, I miss you. Can you take off the mask? Can we just talk? I don't take off the mask. I don't know why I'm standing here, listening to her. I don't know why her presence in her assuring hand has caused me to lower my guard. She smiles. This is the happy, carefree Noriko I grew up with. You're so beautiful, Aoi. I'm really sad we can't be together. How are things with your boyfriend? I... That single useless word crawls out of my rotting mouth like a deceased maggot. It's all I can bring myself to. You can't tell me? Hmm, that's okay. You used to be so open with me. And then, you died. We tried to keep our friendship going after that, but... We've never really been the same since then, have we? I hope you get the help you need, Aoi. I hope one day we can put all of this behind us. My fingers loosen the grip on my knife, weakening. It falls to the concrete ground. I don't need it anymore. I tense my arms and squeeze my hands together, desperately trying to crush Noriko's throat beneath my fingers. Her skin is warm and flushes red as grip tightens. She kicks against me, but the pain doesn't register. She's weak and frail. <laughs> Her strangled cry is drowned out by my own grunts of exertion. Anemic fingers swipe at my arms, constantly only serving to irritate me. I could hold her neck in one hand and use my other to plunge a knife into her face. I could continue to strangle her until I crush her windpipe, or I could slash her stomach open and let her intestines, inten, <laughs> intestines spill onto the ground. All of the options are appealing. All of the options can be put into motion within seconds. I take my right hand off her neck and slip into my jacket, ready to pull out a knife. My left hand closes tighter on her neck, and Noriko closes the distance between us, causing my elbow to bend and allow her closer. Her forehead slams, slams into my own and my neck recoils backward. I'm falling to the ground, only able to th blink once as I try to work out what just happened. She's almost summoned the strength to headbutt me. Frail, weak, ghostly Noriko. Well, different now. <laughs> she actually stood up for herself. She actually struck the person she loves. 
I am dazed but ultimately uninjured. I didn't even feel the impact of my skull against the concrete when I landed flat on my back. Noriko towers over me and rubs her neck ragged, breathing even louder than the thrumming air conditioner. Sorry, Aoi. I had to defend myself. Please, get up. Let's- I get up. I slip the knife into her side and feel it slide neatly between two of her ribs. Her thought thin skin does nothing to resist impalement. Noriko looks down at the wound and mumbles in surprise. I drive the knife deeper and with a flick of my wrist I pull it sideways slashing her belly wide open. Oh my god. An arcing stream of blood sprays from the savage wound and forms a macabre rainbow before me. Noriko coughs and gags as she frantically tries to stem the tide of blood with her hands. Damn it! Corpse girl will... She falls to her knees. Get you. Her empty threat falls with her and her face slams in the concrete. Noriko Kurosawa is dead. Using the very same knife that she slashed her open, I cut along the seams of my jacket and skirt. The strip myself, I strip myself down with, with the blade until I'm standing cold and naked in the factory. It doesn't take long to strip Noriko down as well, but I'm extra careful with her clothes. I don't use the knife this time. I simply put pull her dress up and over her until it slides free from her motionless body. It holds the dress up against me, letting it press against my own form. I look down and admire the side of myself, imagining what I'll look like when I wear it. <laughs> what the hell? I can finally become Noriko. I can wear her clothes, live in her factory, talk to her friends, work at her office. I can do all the things that she loved to do, all the things that made her happy. I slip the dress over my head and force my arms through the sleeves. It's a little long, but overall it fits me nicely. I'm Noriko Kurosawa. Oh. Oh, final act, Noriko Kurosawa. I'm sorry, I need, to, I need to drink water. Okay. When mother killed herself, she didn't die. Well, she died, but not really. Oh, we're seeing the flashbacks now. Okay. It's a funny thought. Everything that she was, everything that made her Asuna Kurosawa, left this planet on that day. Her body remained, but her soul had departed. She got sent away to a care facility. And I didn't see her very often after that. On the rare occasions I visited her, I would always notice that her eyes no longer look like mine. I hate her for that, or for what she did to her family. Yuriko and I were only children at the time, but mother hung herself up from the ceiling and made us watch. What the f- She encouraged us to kick the chair out from underneath her. We didn't understand what she was doing, she told us it was a game. So we kicked the chair and we laughed, and mother laughed. And then her neck, her neck snapped. Oh my god! And she stopped laughing, and that light in her eyes that I once shared with her was extinguished instantly. Yuriko screamed, and I screamed, and Mother just wouldn't move, and we couldn't get her down from the ceiling. And eventually, Yuriko remembered how to call for an ambulance, and the paramedics arrived, and we were taken away. And after that, I was completely effed up because you don't just walk away from something like that and act like like nothing happened. True. I spent years trying to force the painful memories of her attempted suicide out of my mind. But I didn't exactly cope with it very well. How could I? I become terrified of the world and become used to locking myself inside and wasting away. Yuriko dealt with it a little better than me. I can say her rebellious behavior was the right way to cope, but it had to have been healthier than staying inside for weeks at a time. By the time I reached senior high school, I think I had mostly gotten past everything. The vision of mother hanging from the ceiling in front of me didn't haunt my dreams. The sound of her laughter intermingled with screaming didn't always ring in my ears. Aoi helped me through a lot of it. She shared all of her problems with me and it made me feel a bit better, like maybe my life wasn't so bad. Aoi's life was kinda messed up. 
her father was arrested for various crimes and didn't spend much time in her life. When we were about to graduate, he came back to town and violently attacked her. She called me and told me that he killed her. But she killed him too. So it was all going to be okay, her words not mine. I never understood what she meant when she said that she was dead. I think she graduating put some distance between us, so I never truly tried to figure out her words. My own problems came back to haunt me once I moved out of home. I became completely distracted and almost forgot about Aoi, the apartment I moved into. I should have known that the smell of the mold wasn't normal. See? I should have paid attention to the shoddy repair work that I had performed on the wall. I should have just walked away and found somewhere else to live. But that apartment. I suppose that's where I started to lose control of my life. And that's exactly the reason why I need to return there. Several days later. Oh, she went back. <sighs> Looks the same as always. She's alive? <laughs> okay, she's actually alive. I'm not looking forward to climbing the rest of the stairs up the apartment. I can hardly walk at all, even on flat ground. But I have to do this. I can't let stitches and bandages and painkillers distract me from getting inside. I don't know how long I was in the hospital for. None of my personal effects were with me when I woke up. I had no phone, no purse, no handbag. But the doctors monitored me for a few days and didn't let me go even though I told them I had nowhere to return to. They just threw me into the street. They couldn't even tell me what happened to the girl who attacked me. They had no idea if she had been arrested or not. I have been feeling I have a feeling she's still out there. Regardless, I'm here now. My wound is apparently on the mend and I don't have any sign of infection. All I have to focus on is a scent in front of me. Each step I climb is more difficult to conquer than the last. Each time I raise my leg, I experience a tearing, searing agony along the length of my stomach. More than once, I have to stop and check that my stitches haven't torn wide open. When I'm sure my flesh is more or less intact, I continue scaling the mountain. My head throbs and beads of sweat drip down my face. When I hit landing on the level below my apartment, I spy a familiar face. Momo. Noriko? Momo Ogawa, the daughter of Kenji Ogawa, the man I framed in order to maintain my innocence. Hey, Momo. <laughs> Dad! Her pan panic cry isn't the reaction I was suspecting. Her father is exiting their apartment just as Momo cries out. He does a double take before glaring at me. Narco. Surprised to see you here. I can't quite get a grasp of his tone. Is he happy to see me or angry? Does he even know that I'm the reason he was arrested? Well, I'm assuming that the police let him go fairly quickly. After all, he's here at his home and not rotting in a cell. Hello. The landlord said you disappeared. Yeah, kind of. Are you okay? You look like... His gaze turns to the hospital tags adorning my wrist and the package of spare bandages I have slung over my shoulder. You know, you disappeared right around the time the police... Huh? Forget it. It's nothing. I have a bad feeling that he's beginning to piece something together. If he works out that I'm behind his false arrest, then... Sorry, I should go. Yeah. Come on, Momo. Bye bye, Noriko. Okay. <laughs> bye, Momo. The girl waves excitedly as her father leads her downstairs. I should feel relieved that he's safe, but honestly, I just feel guilty. My actions, Corpse Girl's actions, just put a lot of strain on that little family. I have to keep going. The last light of stairs is torture on my battered bad body, but I persevere and reach the front door of my apartment. I'm at this moment that I remember I don't have any keys to get in. Out of desperation, I try turning the handle and the door opens. Either I left the place unlocked or the landlord has been inside and forgot to lock up. I'm just thankful that I can, move, can keep moving forward.
The curtains are open, bathing the living area in soft light. I'm home. Home? No, that's not right. This isn't my home. This isn't Noriko's home. This is Corpse Girl's home. I never really lived here. I simply existed within these walls. The real Noriko was held hostage by an omnipotent presence sealed in this home. The things here are just as I left them so long ago. It's so comforting. It's a comforting feeling, but at the same time, it sends a chill down my spine. It's time to move on. I stride with a purpose toward the kitchenette and slide open one of the drawers. Inside is a small mallet with a metal head. It's a treasure I acquired from the garden shed on the apartment grounds back when I first moved in. It's not very large, but that suits me just fine. I don't have the strength to wield anything bigger than this. Bringing it to bear is still a great deal of effort. I grip the handle with both hands and lift the deceptively heavy tool. Equipped with this tiny weapon of destruction, I slowly lurch through the hallway. I make my way to the very end where a blank stark white wall faces me. The paint on the wall is peeling like it will slap on without care. The plaster is cracked like it was applied by an amateur. And the lingering stench of mold is at its strongest when it's, I stand on the front of the wall. I bring the mallet down with both arms, the heavy metal head crashing into the metal wall or the mold with as much force as I can muster. The struggle of bearing the mallet is taking its toll on my wound. I feel the stitches in my stomach threatening to snap and break. But I can't stop here. I can't stop until I've crushed this wall and revealed the glittering contents of the trove hidden inside. Another swing and another crash against plaster. A cry of pain and another hole in the wall. I scream and swing and ha the hammer and groan and slash and weep and the wall crumbles beneath my sheer force of will. White dust clouds my vision and provokes me into a coughing frenzy. When my eyes and throat clears up, I throw the, the mallet to the carpet and venture forward. I clamber through the human-sized hole in the wall and find myself within the secret cache on the other side. See, it was Shizuko's body. Hoji left it like this. The stench assaulting my nostrils no longer disguises itself as a mold. So he put a false wall and he left her like this. My god. It's the fetid malador of rot and decay. The admirable trademark of decomposing corpse. I spent so long fooling myself into believing it was nothing concerning. I spent so long pretending that the corpse did not live within the walls of this apartment. The truth is, this corpse is pinned to the wall as the root of all evil. It's an infinite fount of misery and despair and malice and death and hatred. This is Corpse Girl. Hello, old friend. The corpse does not reply. To call it a corpse no longer entirely accurate, it has become little more than a skeleton, an osseous edifice, a macabre tribute to the unyielding sands of time. Bones and flesh and hair and fabric blend and intertwine and meld together to form a sickening representation of a human beauty. Beauty. I used to think this body was pure perfection back when the corpse was more or less intact. It was the image of a gorgeous, vibrant young woman. I inspired to become just as beautiful, slender, elegant, graceful with pale skin and dark eyes. Looking at her now, it's clear to see that I was deceived. The form before me is not beautiful. It's revolting. I shaped myself in the image of death, truly believing I was transcending mortal beauty. This corpse controlled me for so long. This corpse manipulated me and made me want to become just like it. Somewhere along the way, my own identity be began to dissolve and I started to believe that I had become this rotting carcass, this pallid bag of flesh. The spell has been broken. I don't know if it's because of my near-death experience or the clarity of mind inspired by an intoxicating cocktail of painkillers, but I no longer want to associate myself with Corpse Girl. I want to be myself, just Noriko. I no longer want to kill in the name of this blasphemous effigy. Corpse Girl, I found you here. Trapped in this storage closet. Just over a year ago. Well, when she moved in, right? And you stole my life from me. 
Looking at her now, I can't help but wonder what the hell went through my mind when I let her possess me. Why did discovering this corpse have such a profound lasting effect on my psyche? I shut my eyes as a wave of dizziness threatens to overcome me. Staggering the near darkness, I, I struggled to retain, regain my balance. I had blocked out of my memory discovering this corpse for so long. I refused to acknowledge it ever happened. But the crystallized fragments of that forgotten memory have finally breached the surface of my consciousness. I can finally recall the event thanks to the clarity brought about by my current state of mind. Okay, we're gonna see the flashback now. It happened several days after I moved into this apartment. The musty smell of mold lured me to the wall at the end of the corridor. The wall that has been hastily patched up and covered with plaster and paint. I wondered about the source of the smell. I figured it might be a leak, a busted pipe that needed repair. Instead of calling upon the landlord for assistance, I took matters into my own hands. Perhaps I was inspired by my newfound independence. I had just become a free young woman, living on my own for the first time. Perhaps I was just stupid. I located a mallet in the garden shed I took. I tore down the wall. I found Corpse Girl and in that moment I fell to my knees. This is Corpse Girl. Someone had hung this corpse upon the wall and decorated the room with books and photographs. Yes, the photographs were of dead people as well, or dead cor or corpses as well as I mean. Right, Koji said this back then. The sight of the dead woman bearing down on me instantly unearthed the buried, buried memories of my mother's attempted suicide. Like, Noriko was okay, like mentally, then when she saw this, she broke. The pain and despair that I had repressed for so long found its ways out of my mouth and formed an unholy scream. So I think the fear of that discovery and the subsequent revival of the subdued memories caused me to slip in and out of consciousness. I was paralyzed by fear and my entire body was wrecked with pain. Looking back now, I feel like I must have spent days lying in heap on the floor of the storage closet. Days spent within a dreary haze of dread and depression and distress. Days spent at the feet of that hanging corpse that form I began to look up to idolize. Days spent in lull, a fever dream, surrounded by photographs on the wall of all manner of corpses. Days and days of my soul and identity slipping between my fingers. Something must have eventually cracked inside me, because I remember getting to my feet and repairing the wall. I don't know how I did it, but I patched it up and painted over it and vacuumed up all the dust and debris from the carpet. And then the memory of the entire incident just vanished from my mind. The only relic I retrieved from that storage space was a single book, a heavy tome that must have stumbled out of the closet during my delirium. Let me guess, it is the... Her photo book, right? Is that it? The Fosse photography. Yes! This one. A comprehensive history of photo manipulation. That was the book. Like she was not interested in any of this. This messed her up. Basically what Kojir did. Messed Noriko up. Now? Corpse Girl doesn't look the way she used to. Uncovering her today hasn't shocked me to submission like it did all the time ago. Am I stronger now? No, not really. But I was prepared to face her this time. And now I'm here to bury her. As I calmly assess how difficult it will be to retrieve her from her position, my eyes fall upon the dozens of photos plastered haphazardly across the wall. Photographs of nameless bodies printed with an instant camera. There must be 10 or 20 or 30 corpses across the entire series of images. I don't recognize any of them. That's the only comfort I can take from viewing the images. The comfort that I'm not the one who decorated this room with this macabre visuals. Whoever put these photos up is undoubtedly the same person responsible for hanging corpse girl on the wall. All of the photos look real and all of the corpses are in such normal situations. There's an image of a decomposing body sitting on a bench waiting at a train platform. He's wearing a suit like any ordinary businessman. Another image is of a headless couple at a dinner table, dressed in their Sunday's best, but they're sharing a candlelit meal. Oh my god. So this is what Kojiro was doing? He's taking pictures of them? 
Corpses going about their daily life, it's eerily reminiscent of something else I've encountered before. What was it? A book I read. Instinctively, my eyes dart to the piles of books toppled in the corner of the storage room. There are dozens of dupl duplicate books as if they were abandoned here by their own author. I crouch and dust off the cover of the book at the top of the pile. Dazed by Dead by Noble Sinclair. Noble Sinclair. Underneath 10 more copies of that volume is a different book with a familiar cover. Strange Flower. I know this. Yeah, Kojiro gave me the very same book that Kojiro lent me so long ago. Except the book here is not some worn, well-read library copy. It's in pristine condition, save for the layer of dust coating it. There are nearly a dozen copies of this book as well. Someone intentionally abandoned these books here and the fact that they are accompanying me or accompanying so many photos of corpses, not to mention Miss Corpse Girl herself, is no coincidence. These books and photos, as well as the copy of the Fosse photography I found here so long ago, all of this embedded itself into my consciousness and inspired me to start Corpse Girl's website. I'm sure of it. This room is... This effing cursed room ruined my life and corrupted my mind. And I have no... I have to wonder if somebody planned it all. Did somebody leave all of these things here in order to break whoever entered? It's probably a far-fetched concept, but... I'm desperate to place the blame on somebody, anybody but myself. Enough. A light slap to my face snaps me out of my inner ramblings. It's time to bury Corpse Girl and put this life behind me once and for all. I can't really atone for the things I've done this last year. Hell, I don't actually feel like I need to atone. It's not guilt that's eating me up inside. But at the very least, I can move on. I carefully remove the restraints tying Corpse Girl to the wall and feel the weight of her rotted corpse or rotted body collapse, collapse against my own frail form. Her head leans against my shoulder and for a brief moment, I pause and let her rest against me. I ran a hand through what's left of her hair. She's been through a lot. We both have. We're both Corpse Girl. Well, we both used to be. Now we're just empty husk with no purpose. If we're not Corpse Girl, we'll probably be forgotten, lost to time and memory. For once in my life, I'm looking forward to being forgotten. Dude, I, I, feel, I kind of feel sorry for her. This messed her up. Ooh, bonus ending, Tomoe. First time we're playing as Tomoe. <laughs> God, this place is boring as hell. After all the shit I've been through this year, I simply can't believe I'm still working here. If it weren't for Shinya, I probably wouldn't bother coming in every other day. But I want to patch things up with him. If I keep talking to him in the office, surely I'll crawl my way to forgiveness. Speaking of that... Okay, here he comes now. Look at him. He walks past my desk and doesn't even acknowledge my existence. How can he ignore me after all the time we spent together? Here it takes the shit out of me sometimes. I'll just have to take the matter to my own hands. If he won't talk to me, I'll just make him talk. I leave my desk and stride over to him. My heavy footsteps aren't exactly elegant or befitting a lady, as my mother used to always say, but I don't really give a that hey, word. What's going on? The slurred or rolling words that drip from my mouth don't come out the way I want. That always seems to be the case. Everyone treats me like some dumbass dipshit because of the way I speak. They don't understand that it's the way somebody thinks that really matters. I can't help it if I was brought up to speak like a effing imbecile. Blame my father, not me. Oh, hello, Tomoe. Hello yourself. What's a gal gotta do to get a conversation out of you these days? Huh? What do you mean? Come on. You know we don't speak like we used to. Well, we broke up. You dumped me. What exactly do you expect from me now? Oh, please. You know I'm sorry for that. I told you a thousand times that breaking it off with you was the stupidest thing I've ever done. So come on. 
Get back together with me, will ya? Tomoe. You broke my heart. Yeah, I know. Shinya, I really love ya. I need you. I'm not normally one to get embarrassed, but letting my feelings hang in the air between us really makes me feel feel uncomfortable. Did you hear about my father? Huh? I wasn't expecting him to shrug off my confession with a swift change of topic. He's tracked down an important member of the Human Removal Service. Ooh. Jeez, not this shit again. Can't you just let it all go? No, I can never do that. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. I could use a hand, if you're willing to assist. Having someone by my side with insider information would be rather handy. Don't you agree? <sighs> I'm kind of blindsided by his request. I know that he knows everything. I'd be stupid to pretend he hasn't figured it out all by now. He knows my involvement in Noriko. He knows that I had a hand, however indirect, in the suicide cases that Corpse Girl painted across the city. I'm not going to judge you for working with Noriko. If you can help me bring the greater perpetrator to justice, the head of the Human Removal Service, then... then I think it may have been a good thing that you did what you did. That's so... You'd forgive me for getting involved with such stupid shit? Yes. I'd have no choice but to forgive you. And maybe we can even move further forward. I know he's just saying what I want to hear. He can be manipulative in his own way. But if there's a chance I can make up for this, I've done and win Shinya over again, then I have to go for it. Right. Sign me up then, or whatever. I'll help out. Thank you, Tomoe. I'm going to interview the individual involved with the Human Removal Service. Are you allowed to do that? Of course. Father said I'm an important member of the investigation team now. I'd like you to come with me. You might be able to point out any inconsistencies in his testimony. Okay, who is this gonna be? Yeah, I don't know about that, but I'll do my best. For the first time in a long time, Shinya smiles at me. Is this gonna be... It's not Aoi. Junpei? Maybe Junpei. Junpei's still alive, right? Oh, shit, man. Oh, I, I told <laughs> okay. you. I don't know. It's Junpei. Lock his ass up. Can you just leave me alone? This guy's pathetic. Every time I open my mouth, he flinches and recoils in terror. Like he thinks I'm going to hit him or stab him. Listen here, you little shit. If you don't spill the deets, my man here will crush your fat skull into dust. Yeah, spill the deets. Tomoe. <laughs> Maybe you should let me do the talking from here on out. Uh, whatever. I back off and let Chinya take my place. I talk him up, so I thought he'd be pleased, but maybe I, I, I just annoyed him. Mr. Matsumoto. Please, just call me June. Hey, nice try, mister. I ain't your friend. You can address me formally. Thank you very much. He folds his arms across his chest and adopts the pouting expression of a child. Um, yes. Well, uh, as I was saying, Mr. Matsumoto, you understand why you've been brought in for questioning, yes? Yeah, man, but, like, I'm totes innocent, you know? I don't even know nothing about the Human Removal Service. You guys think I'm involved, but you haven't given a reason why you think that. <sighs> Shinya retrieves a small pocket notebook from somewhere and flips through the pages. After a moment's silence, he clears his throat. Several witnesses, plus a security camera, placed you at the scene of a murder just two days ago. Now, it's apparent you weren't the culprit. However, your activities at the time of the incident were questionable at best. 
Oh, what activities are you referring to, detective man? You were cheering, and I quote, Kill him dead. Kill him dead. Yo, that don't sound like something I'd say. I want my lawyer. You can't detain me here. Mr. Matsumoto, you willingly came here when we contacted you. You are not under arrest. <laughs> this is ludicrous. Ludicrous, I say! Be that as it may, I have a few more questions. One witness declared that you followed the masked culprit after they fled the scene of the crime. Is there any truth to this claim? Nah, man, like, I just needed to go the same direction, you know? I've got no idea who this Harold person you keep mentioning is. Genia raises an eyebrow and casts me a dark look. I just shrug. I never mentioned the word Harold. Is that the name the culprit refers to themselves as? Got him. Oh, this is like some detective mind trick, ain't it? I have the right to remain silent. Anything I say or do, or, or whatever, can be like... Hey, Shinya ain't a cop though. I have enough of these creeps' inane ramblings. Listen up! I slam my fist against the table and send Junfei rolling back in his seat. He nearly falls off the chair, but manages to regain his balance. You've got two options here. Number one, tell us the identity of that killer. The person you called the Herald. What? What's the other option? Number two, tell us who is really in charge of the Human Removal Service. <laughs> Why is <laughs> crying now? <laughs> He's sweaty, pulsating forward, his glowing red. I'll. He's crying. I'll... I can't betray the identity of the Herald. I just can't. But the guy behind all of this? I say fuck him. I'll sell him out if it means you'll pardon my involvement. I don't know what caused his sudden change in attitude, but Shinya gives me a grateful nod and it feels good to have been helpful. Please, Mr. Matsumoto, please give us a name. Okay, look, you gotta know this. I don't have all the deeds, okay? I'm not as important as y'all think I am. But the guy running this whole thing, he's got an army of masked killers. An army of damaged chicks all going around killing and calling themselves the Herald. So everyone is, or every Herald is a girl? And the name of this ringleader? Like I said, I don't know everything. I don't got his full name. I only know him as N. Sinclair. Noble Sinclair. A foreign name, although the first name could be Japanese, I suppose. Shinya is jotting the name down and confirming the correct spelling with Junpei. I find myself lost in thought, far detached from this moment. For some strange reason, Noriko's face pops into my mind. I have a fuzzy recollection of a conversation with her, but any attempt to clarify the thought is in my mind is useless. Shinya, is the name familiar to you? Yes. Amazingly, amazing, Shinya always surprises me. So who is it? Noriko Kurosawa once told me about a book she was reading. Now, please understand, I don't share the same taste in fiction as hers, so... Yeah, yeah, I get it. Get to the point. <clears throat> she used to read the most macabre, horrific stories. And she told me about one book in particular. A book about a man obsessed with corpses. Obsessed with corpses, huh? Jeez, don't that sound familiar? Wait, what am I saying? That does sound familiar. She told me about that book, too. Flower, 
something about a flower. Yes, strange flower. A book by Nobel Sinclair. Nobel Sinclair. And Sinclair himself. Jeez. You reckon that's the guy behind the human removal service? This is weird, but... Kojiro... I mean, as... As Shinya is saying, Ko, uh, the noble... Si uh, this strange flower, right? Is... Uh, the man is, what do you call Obsessed with corpses? Kojiro is obsessed with corpses as well. And he has a lot of books of Noble Sinclair. So maybe he's Noble Sinclair. Yeah, he's the author of those books. I don't know, but it's a lead. Okay, let's just find out. A man obsessed with the dead. Truly despicable. That's one way to put it. I've done my time with sickos like that, had enough of it, and put it all behind me. Oh, Detective man. Can I, like, go now? Yeah, but the thing is, Kojiro is dead now. And Junpei, it, Junpei burned him, right? Absolutely not. Shinya turns away from Junpei and beckons for one of the armed of police officers standing guard at the room's entrance. The officer walks over and awaits Shinya's command. Arrest this man. Yo, that's whack. What are you doing? The police officer coughs Junpei and yanks him out of his chair. Damn. Shinya, that was cold. It had to be done. Junpei Matsumoto is dragged away, kicking and screaming. Silence fall upon the room after the door closes in the police officer's wake. So, what now, detective man? Shinya scratches his chin as though wondering why I would call him that, but he doesn't voice his uh, discontent. Our next step is to track down the author, Nobel Sinclair. Maybe he's our culprit, maybe not. Either way, we won't know until we talk to him. Right on. Um, and... What about... <laughs> Shinya interrupts me with a sudden soft kiss on the lips. I close my eyes and lean into him, letting his warmth envelop me. Shinya... I couldn't have done this without you, Tomoe. Oh. <laughs> and I wouldn't be the man I am today had it not been for you. So, thank you. Does this mean you want to be with me again? Yes. If you'll have me. My heart swells with its confirmation. I've never been so happy. <laughs> Shinya, of course! He kisses me again, and the fear I had of losing him instantly washes away. I won't F up this time. I'll keep him close to me and protect him forever. I reluctantly break away from his embrace and hold his chin delicately in my fingers. Let's go find this Nobel Sinclair fucker. Yes. Let's find him and bring him to justice. But yeah, if Koji was Nobel Sinclair, why would he cut his arm off, right? Okay, ending true, three months later. Sometimes on dark and overcast days, I can feel the cold bite of steel inside my gut. It's some phantom sensation that flickers and dissipates within a moment. My doctor says it's nothing to be concerned about, but that doesn't prevent me from pulling my clothes aside to examine the skin underneath. The sight of the scar does little to comfort me. I don't think I should have survived this injury. I don't think I should have walked away after regaining consciousness. But somehow I survived that encounter with Aoi. In the darkest recesses of my memory, I can vaguely recall the warmth of the strong, ar of strong arms carrying me from that factory, carrying me to safety. What? Somebody saved me on that fateful day, but I don't know who. Regardless, I owed them my life, my new life, I love a life that is actually worth something. A life that doesn't consist of skulking in the shadows and pretending to be a beautiful corpse. I look down at the empty pl plate before me and smile. I'm still not accustomed to the sight of a finished meal, but I'm slowly learning to love it. My stomach feels full, truly full, not just full enough like I used to force myself to believe. I put on 4 pounds recently. Four good healthy pounds. My cheek glow with vitality and my skin is no longer the sickly color of a ghastly flesh. 
The waiter says restaurants are probably getting sick of seeing me in here every other day. But I don't mind. They eat well here and they learn to cook at home too. Tomwe of all people taught me how to prepare dinner. Oh, they're friends again. I never expected to study the culinary arts under someone like her. But she has a knack for bringing out the flavor in food. She says she picked up a few things from years of caring for her kid siblings. I'm learning a lot from her. I push my plate to the side and take a sip of water. Time to pay the bill and get going. There are things to do tonight after all. Oh, she went back? Months have passed since the last time I set foot on this cursed ground. The wafting stench of decay invades my nostrils and threatens to make me spill the contents of my stomach on the asphalt. It's a stench that I once completely accustomed to. Was once, I mean, sorry. Now it's sickening remind, sickening reminder of the person I used to be not so long ago. I didn't want to come here tonight. I didn't want to come here ever. Yet here I am. Call it a hunch or a premonition or just a bad feeling, but some part of my mind urged me to visit this place after receiving a strange text this morning. A text message that seemed both alien and familiar at the same time. A solitary word decorated the contents of the message, goodbye. But what drew my attention the most was the image attachment, a photo of a young woman. A young woman bent over backwards, her face obscured by matted hair and blood and her chest expo exploding open from the inside the young woman in the photo was me it was an image of my own corpse the craftsmanship was excellent the cadaver used to replicate my body looked just like me my first assumption was that the human removal service sent this photo to me but upo upon a moment of deliberation that didn't seem to be the case the hrs activity has declined rapidly as of late the number of murders or suicides, depending on how you look at it across Tokyo, have decelerated so quickly that it's almost as if the HRS never existed at all. Besides, that organization had particular trademark when sending out doctored photos. They would include instructions with the message, instructions for the victim to follow, usually involving the murder of another victim. The message I received simply said goodbye. My corpse photo feels personal. It's typical of the work I used to perform. It's almost as if somebody took over the identity of Corpse Girl, the role that I once filled. But think, that's crazy, isn't it? I take a deep breath and stride toward the factory's entrance. I almost choked as I breathe in the thick air that the stench of death hangs like smoke inside the factory. This place looks just as it did when I was last here. The notable exceptions are the fresh cadavers displayed here and there upon the warehouse racks. Somebody is living here. Somebody is continuing Corpse Girl's work. And somebody thought it would be wise to target me as a victim. Me, Noriko Kurosawa. Somebody made a fatal mistake. Animalistic instinct rises within me as my legs move with purpose. My feet claw the damaged concrete ground with every step. I'll kill the new Corpse Girl. I'll kill her and bury her. Enough is enough. I'll end the cycle of death that I started so long ago. Hello? Who are you? Oh my guys, Aoi. She's still here? A meek voice slinks through the darkness, tugging aside the veil of silence over so gently. I concentrate hard in order to identify the direction it came from. If I'm taken off guard, even for just a second, it might be my end. My left? The voice came from my left. On your left, Captain America. I spin on one heel and immediately feel bile rise in my throat. May I help you with what something? What the fuck? It's so crazy. <laughs> what the? Oh my god. She's actually wearing Noriko's clothes. Her hair is black with a red stripe there. Oh, <laughs> what the? What the fuck is this? My name is Noriko. Noriko Kurosawa. It's nice to meet you. Dude, she's the most messed up of all the people in this game. Aoi. I. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Aoi? Is that you? I feel like I'm looking into a twisted mirror. The girl before me is not me, and yet. Are you here to buy a corpse? 
plenty on display. You can browse as much as you like. <laughs> what the f... But that one on the end of the rack is reserved. Sorry. She runs her grimy hand through her unwashed hair and scratches her scalp violently. A fleck of spittle drips from her lower lip as her eye eyes glaze over. This is Aoi Sato, despite the hair and makeup and the clothes. My clothes? Her voice is the same as I remember. Aoi, knock it off. You're scaring me. Um, who is Aoi? Is that your name? Well, it's nice to meet you, Aoi. My name is Noriko. <laughs> A moment of clarity brings immediate understanding. Just like I was torn between my own identity and that of Corpse Girl, Aoi became me. But her transformation hasn't been kind to her. Any recognition of her previous life simply vanished, and she doesn't even know her real name. After everything I've been through, I should be more forgiving to someone struggling with their identity. I should be understanding and sympathetic. Aoi Noriko gasps for an air as my fingers clench her throat oh did she ki she's killing her now i ram my knee into her stomach and smash her into the warehouse racking causing several stiff cadavers to crash to the ground around us <coughs> Stop. aoi has lost herself she has discarded all remnants of who she once was i'm fine with that i can always relate to it but I am Noriko Kurosawa. I have reclaimed my true self and I won't let her become me. I am Noriko Kurosawa. And this, and this girl, this girl that stabbed me and left me for dead, will not take my life away from me. <coughs> Die! Die! I press Aoi against the steel racks and feel something within her frail body either bend or break. Her dull, tired eyes begin to droop and the hands scratching at my wrist suddenly give up the fight. I realize I'm panting heavily as I clutch her neck. Her own ragged breathing synchronizes with mine and it's almost as though we are one person. No. She's not me. You are not me! I scream and my fingernails puncture her skin. My fingers pierce her neck and drill into her flesh, stopping only when they clasp tightly around her spinal column. With all the strength I can pull from within me, I twist my arm and throw Aoi to the blood-spattered sp concrete. She hits the ground unceremoniously, her lightweight body barely making a sound as her vacant, dead eyes stare up at the cracked ceiling. Is that Aoi? Who's that? I never imagined I'd have to dig up this grave for a second time. Who is that though? Oh, it's Corpse Girl. Okay. Oh, it was Skeleton. I thought it was Aoi. When I buried Corpse Girl in the gardens below our former apartment, I didn't predict I'd have to see her again so soon. But here she is. She's still rotten and miserable. I thought her burial was going to be the end of it all. A symbolic gesture to help me leave behind the person I had become. Dude, how did she even get the corpse out of the apartment? Like, are people blind everywhere? Like, even Koji, right? He pulled the corpse in the street. And, yeah, people were screaming, but no one reported them. It was a reclaim to my former self and bury the past. Corpse Girl doesn't say anything when she does see me lift the dirt from her resting place. She doesn't give any indication that she even notices my presence. Fine, be that way. I couldn't care less. I brought a friend for you. Someone to keep you company. Oh, there she puts Aoi. With a great deal of effort, I hold the body of Nor No, of Aoi into the narrow pit and let it collapse beside Corpse Girl. The girl in my old clothes seems to call up to her new companion. It's almost fitting that the person who became me should rest eternally beside the person I tried to become. I think I can rest easy knowing that they're both in the ground. I think nothing further can prevent me from being Noriko. Suppose I should say a few words. You were my best friend, Aoi. And I'm sorry I couldn't save you. I'm sorry that I only ever wanted to save myself. I hope that you at least found some happiness by becoming me. Goodbye. 
I clutch a small shovel in my hand and begin to feel the makeshift grave. Dirt and rocks pile into the pit slowly. I mistake the faint howl of the wind as the final moan from the girl I once knew as Aoi. Covered in dirt and grime and blood and muck and god knows what else, I collapse onto the floor in my new apartment. I'm very fortunate I managed to find this place. Someone moved out in a hurry and I was able to move right in with just the first month's rent paid up front. Don't know if I'll able to afford next month's payment, but I'll face the challenge when it arrives. For now, everything is finally over. I should shower or bathe or at least scrub that filth from my skin. But I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. This is the price of being Noriko Kurosawa. I rolled onto my side and grabbed my phone, slowly bringing it to eye level. An involuntary frown masked my dirt and crusted face when I noticed the icon for one missed call on my screen, an unknown number. A short message tells me that the caller left a voicemail. I don't know who would have called me at such a late hour, it's well past midnight after all. I close my eyes and let the voicemail play. Hey. Oh, it's Kojiro. He is a noble. He's still alive. Bit late, Saws. Yeah, it's Saws. It is Saws. We should talk. <laughs> Call me. No reaction from Noriko. One year later. The book is almost warm in my hand. It's a pristine volume, fresh off the printing press. Paperback though, I would have preferred a hardback. Been a while since I last published a book. Years. The few fans I have probably thought it disappeared off the face of the planet. I did in a way. Not my fault. Death is death. Noble Sinclair died in a fire inside his family home. That was a long time ago. Even though my name burned to ash, my body survived. Oh, his actual name is Noble Sinclair. Had to pick a new name after that. Can't wander this planet without one. This body went on living for quite a while with a new name. I even grew to like it. Then the strangest thing happened. Another fire inside a morgue. This time the new name went up in flames. My body survived again. Fate? Don't know. Felt a bit lost after that. Felt a bit unlike anybody. I decided to pick the old name back up. Dusted it off. Pinned it on my chest. Noble Sinclair, it always suited me. Mother gave it to me after all. This time, I didn't want to completely disregard my existence. The time I spent as another man, too much happened. I've got too much to tell, too many tales to keep to myself. So this new book tells the entire story from start to end. Oh, Corpse Factory, Noble Sinclair. The look at his arm is also gone. Dumbass cut his own... <laughs> This dude cut his own arm and it was the wrong one. <laughs> Wasn't easy typing page after page with only one arm. One of the most taxing and challenging things I've ever attempted. But now it's done. I mean he's smart to do all of this but he still cut off his arm. He's so obsessed with Noriko. Soon this new volume will hit store shelves across the country. The world will know everything. I use pseudonyms throughout the book to protect the identities of the guilty. Didn't print Noriko Kurosawa's real name even once. Didn't identify Junpei or Aoi. Didn't call out Tomei or even that wannabe detective that chases me, Shinya. And most importantly, I didn't print my previous name. Not that name anyway. I confess a lot of things within the sticks. I even confessed my involvement with the Human Revo Removal Service. Getting caught up in that organization's Web of Death wasn't something I ever intended to. It wasn't something Kojiro ever would have done, but it was necessary. Necessary in order to finish his latest book. Noble Sinclair rose to the ranks of the Shadow Society within mere weeks. Also, there, so the society was already established? What? Chalk it up to his or my macabre experience. Couldn't have done it without the connections I formed as Kojiro. Couldn't have done any of this without him. I'm at the top of the ladder now, so to speak. Got a bunch of killers on my payroll. Even the dog Junpei is on my leash now. Don't know where I'll go from here. Original plan was to shut down the HRS service. 
and deletes the existence of the final act of love for Noriko. Okay. But the power is nice. The power is intoxicating. Again, Kojiro wouldn't have toyed around with something like this. I'm not Kojiro. I look over the book in my hands once more. It's heavy, full of words that carry more weight than they should. Whether people believe the content of this book is out of my control, but those with a keen intellect will surely be able to piece the truth together. My eyes scan the cover and read over the large embossed letters. Corpse Factory, a novel by Noble Sinclair. I've never been more proud of my work. Jesus Christ. It is over. Is it over? The end. Oh, we got the ending as well. True ending. I mean, gallery. Well, there are two here. But yeah, they should have, uh, like, explained the HRS more, right? Like, they weren't, there were no HRS before Corpse Girl, then it grew, right? It suddenly grew at the same time as Corpse Girl. So in a matter, like, a matter of weeks, they had a very, very huge organization. I hope that, I wish that they had, or like, explored it a little bit more. And Shinya as well, I hope that, or I wish that they put him more in the story. The ending was okay, I guess. It was okay. I mean, that game got weaker by the end, not gonna lie. Like, I hope there was a different ending, like... And no one died, right? No one actually died from the characters. Did someone die? No, no one. Actually, no one died. Maybe if Aoi, for example, Aoi became Corpse Girl, <laughs> then she got arrested, uh, that would be much better, I think. But yeah, that's the ending we got. Let's check the ending so we can check it. I don't want to read anymore though. Okay, we got true or false. Bonus. Bonus ending was with Tomoe, right? Hell. Okay, let's see hell. Hell. Ending hell. Three months later. Good morning. Sorry I'm late. What? She's going to work now in this ending? What the fuck? Okay, I make a quick apologetic bow to my co-workers before hurrying over to my... <laughs> what? No one seems to be bothered about my tardiness. A few people offer a raised eyebrow, but they quickly return to their own work. I'll take a seat at my workstation and switch my computer on it. And we're still alive as I organize my belongings. From my handbag, I retrieve some key items. Okay, it's the same thing she's doing as um, same thing as Norika was doing. <laughs> Canned coffee, second headphones. Last and not least, my phone. Is this, uh, screen is a little cracked. Sometimes something feels slightly off as I look at the screen. There's a nagging feeling in my mind. Some small voice telling me that this is, isn't my phone, but. I know it's mine, the familiar red case, the spider web fractures inching across the glass. It's my phone, no doubt about it. Pushing the strange thought from my mind, I turn my attention to the computer. It doesn't take long to read over the day's list of easy tasks. I'll be continuing what I started yesterday, easy. Noriko? <laughs> Okay, I've startled by the sudden vocalization of my name. I don't know why people call me by my name every day. Don't they? Oh, hello, Fujikawa. Shinya Fujikawa is standing at my desk, scratching his cheek awkwardly. I get the feeling he wants to approach a topic of conversation that makes him nervous. I... um... I wanted to apologize. I haven't been present in the office of late. Was there anything you needed to discuss with me during my absence? Um. I think about the question. 
Shinya and I don't really need to talk on a day-to-day -day basis. His work is fairly unrelated to mine. I'm just a data entry temp, after all. Well, we do have a history together, I suppose. We went to school together, after all. We were never exactly friends. Actually, I always kind of hoped that the feeling he had a crush on me, but he's not really the type of a guy to make a confession. Aoi always used to joke about how he and I would make a cute couple. But I could never see you was. Dude, I can't take this seriously, dude. It's Aoi. What the hell, man? Why does the name sound so distant? I tried to put a face into the name, but my mind draws blank. She was my best friend in yet. Noriko. Oh, sorry. I get lost in my own head sometimes. Ah, uh, yes. I see. Well, if there's nothing you need, then I'll be on my way. This was three, th three months later, right? What? <laughs> okay, then. Why are they acting like this? Say, uh... Hmm? Your old friend, uh, Aoi Sato? How about Tomoe? Where's Tomoe? Have you heard from her lately? No. Actually, I feel like something must have happened to her. We haven't spoken in... God knows how long. Is that so? That's too bad. Okay, I find it odd that he leaves the conversation with those last words. He simply walks away from the desk. My phone cries out. The unfamiliar ringtone, one that I never selected, splits my head wide open and prompts my brain to spill out between the cracks of my skull. I squeeze the sludgy gray matter back into my head and blink a few times, then realize that my brain is not actually leaking, just a trick of the light. I struggle to maintain eye contact with the screen. The caller ID flashes across the device, identifying the caller as Noriko. Me, my own name, myself, Noriko is calling me, I'm calling myself. A dull ache still throbs within my head as though it has been recently emptied. I answer the call. Hello? I hear a sharp inhalation of breath and then the call cuts out. It takes a few seconds for me to realize I'm crying. Shinya is at my side, his arm around my shoulders, and within seconds, the rest of the co-workers are staring down at me. I'm on the floor, my face nestled within the plush office carpet, but I don't know how I got here. I'm supposed to be stoic unflinching. It's my ideology, my entire identity. So much for stoic unflinching Noriko. Remember stoic unflinching Noriko? Maybe if I just close my eyes, I can make everything return to normal and start this day over again. Well, she's now going home. <laughs> the stairs upward feel particularly difficult to climb today. It was a rather strange day at the office, but I know that returning home to my family will make me feel better. Shinya took me to the train station and waited until I boarded my train. It was really sweet of him. I don't really, I don't fully recall things that he said to me. He might have mentioned something about not needing to return to the office anymore. Maybe all my work there is completed. My head is still fuzzy, but... I'll sift through the details after a hot shower later tonight. Since the sun is beginning to go down, I think the other should be home by now. Yuriko is probably relaxing on the sofa and mother should be definitely be here. What? Since she doesn't leave the apartment these days. I unlock the door to the apartment and wander inside. What the f- I don't understand. It's I'm home. What? What is this hell ending? Why is Noriko- why is Yuriko's body here? Like it's been about, about half a year now, right? If it says three months later, then she died like a couple months later back. So it's almost half a year and she's her body's still intact like this. Uh, here you are. Good evening, big sis. Good evening, mom. Yurko offers me a warm smile. She's changed a lot recently. Her foul, rebellious attitude disappeared when she moved in. Maybe she simply wanted her family to be re reunited again. Maybe her delinquency was all just an act, a way of trying to deny what really wanted. To simply return home. Mother, on the other hand, doesn't really regard my entrance, but that's nothing to be concerned about. She's always distant and aloof. Shall we order in tonight? I'm thinking some pizza would be delicious. Yuriko nods. The act causes a small clump of her hair to detach and flutter to the floor. I'm looking forward to a quiet night in my 
in with family and some pizza. I never had the opportunity to enjoy these moments when I was growing up. In those days, I was simply grateful for the nights I could go to bed without a new bruise or gash to cover up. Mother used to kick me and slap me, but hang on. I look at her now, slumped on the couch, completely lost in her own world. That's not the mother that used to abuse me. That's not the mother that was married to my father. And Yuriko never used to stand up for me, but that's because... Because she was never there to begin with. Yuriko was never there when I was growing up. Where was she? I shut my eyes and tried to sift through my, the confusing fragments of memory swirling within my mind. She's not my mother, this woman before me. She's Noriko's mother, that's it. That's how I know her. Wait, of course she's my mother. I'm Noriko, duh. How could I ever forget something so simple? Yuriko was there when I was growing up. The reason she would never stood up for me is because no one ever abused me. God, I don't know why I get so confused and frazzled like this sometimes. I smile at my loving family and clap my hands together. Okay, I'm going to order dinner. Is everyone happy with barbecue pizza? Yuriko nods and the mother lets a quiet snore of approval. I whip my phone up to eye level and open a food delivery app. I notice that my battery has only 8% left. I should charge it up before it dies on me. I keep a charger here in the living room so it only takes me a second to waltz the wall socket. As I lean toward or I lean down to grab the charger, I see that another phone is already plugged in. Another phone? The case is blue and screen doesn't have a trace of damage on it. Whose phone is this? I nervously tap the screen and see a list of noise notifications. There are a lot of messages from someone named Junpei. Junpei, it doesn't it's it's a name that doesn't ring a bell. I check to see if the phone is unlocked by pressing my thumb against the home button. Strangely, my fingerprint unlocks the phone instantly. My fingerprint? But this isn't my phone. This can't be my phone. The messages from Junpei all open in quick succession. Babe, good news. Waiting for you. Coffee today? Are you mad at me? Talk to me. I miss you. Did I do something wrong? That splitting sensation inside my skull returns as my eyes devour the contents of the never-ending string of messages. I feel like I know this person, but I can't picture a face, I can't picture any scenario in which we have ever met or spent time together. Why does it speak to me in such a familiar way? Wait, you're not, you're not speaking to me. Of course, this isn't my phone, so these messages were never intended for me. I throw the phone aside, happy to have a broken free of my concern. It doesn't matter who the phone belongs to. It's not, it's not mine, so I don't have to deal with it. I plug my own phone in the charger and feel relieved as I watch the battery icon slowly fill up. Okay, Mom, Yuriko, I'm going to go take a shower while my phone charges. I'll order dinner after that, I promise. Thank you for being patient. For the first time in a while, Mother actively responds to my voice. Noriko? Her head lifts slightly and she regards me with her doll eyes. Mom? You... Where am I? You're... You're not Noriko. A bead of sweat forms on my forehead and I shiver a crawl slowly down in my spine like a spider. Her, faint, her firm ac accusatory tone immediately chills me to the bone. Of course it's me, Mom. It's me, Noriko. No. You're... You're... Where am I? Panic settles on her delirious face. I don't exactly blame her for being scared and confused. She's been in a near vegetative state ever since her attempted suicide. But for her to rec not recognize me? For her to forget what her own daughter looks like, that's inexcusable, unforgivable. I'm Noriko, damn it. I'm. I fall to my knees, the splitting, throbbing, aching pain in my skull, reaching a crescendo, threatening to blow my brains out across the living room. I'm Noriko! <laughs> Noriko Kurosawa! Look at me, Mom! Look at me! 
Mother's eyes widen and she looks like she's going to vomit. She turns to see Yuriko, white and ghastly in the seat next to her and a tear forms in her eye. What have you done? What is this? Just shut up! Just shut up and be a part of my perfect family! Look at us! All three of us! We're the Kurosawa family! And we're finally back together! We're happy, right? We're... happy! Still on my knees, I slowly lower my head to the ground and let it rest on the soft carpet. I barely register the sound of the door behind me opening slowly. After the creaking hinges comes to rest, a strong voice floods my ears. Yo, Harold. Why who's that? You're Noriko no longer. Got work for you. Oh, it's uh, Koji. The source of the voice wanders towards me and towers above my face down form. He said I'm no longer Noriko. Can an identity just slip away so easily? Can it vanish into thin air? Like it never was it was never truly a part of me? No. I am I will always be. I am Noriko! I leap to my feet and launch myself at the man, the man who dared to enter my apartment and tell me that I'm not truly who I want to be. I barely catch a glimpse of his face before he pummels me in the nose with a broad fist. I'm on the floor again an instant, the dizzying lights above me spinning in my blurred Get vision. Get up. Get your things. We're cleaning up after Corpse Girl's mess. I didn't like- I didn't like that hell ending, man. Like, if it was hell ending, it should've just, like, killed everyone. Killed Tomoe, maybe killed Shinya, killed Noriko, actually. Right? Why is that like that? Why isn't Yuriko there? Her body should have been like super decomposed or and what I call this? Or cremated by then, right? It's been so long, like a couple months or half a year already. And it also said there when we started the hell, it's three months later. So basically it's the same time as by the ending, right? What the hell is this? And they and like they just made it creepy <laughs> but thank god we got the true ending yeah that was much uh, that was much better anyways so yeah this is corpse factory guys like i hope or i wish that they just expanded it more a little bit maybe a little bit more a couple more hours of the game like to fully explore it it could have been better by the end i mean <laughs> like the best parts were at noriko's arc I was starting then kind of got in weird kind of got in <laughs> kind of confusing sometimes and yeah anyways it's kind of cool though that Hojo was no no ball Sinclair a little bit but yeah it's kind of cool and by the end they told us that it was like Shizuko's body was there in the or that's how Noriko like broke or something Anyways, this is it. So I'm gonna see you in the next visual novel. By, by the way, if you have any like suggestions of any visual novels, mysteries, yes, I like mysteries and horror, but the thing with visual novels and like uploading it, you can't really like just upload some or any visual novels. Sometimes the other visual novels will they will strike you. <laughs> they don't want that. So maybe if you have any suggestions, you can write it down. So I'm just going to see you then. Bye-bye.